Good evening, everyone. My name is Monica Sikora, and joining me today for a very, very special power hour is my fabulous colleague, Rachel, our amazing sports massage therapist. It is such a pleasure to have you, Rachel. I was so looking forward to this one. <laughs> I look forward to the chat. Oh, yes. And actually, I think this is something very, very important that we're going to be covering today, something that um, both of us have seen a lot and a lot of people are struggling, especially this year and especially since the lockdown um, has begun and a lot of people work from home. Um, and that is how to go about our hypermobility, uh, what to do, what not to do, what are some of the misconceptions, um, you know, is it true that every time you move something dislocates or how to really, how to really make sense of your hypermobility and certain symptoms that you might be experiencing um, and maybe certain things that you might be experiencing and you didn't know it is hypermobility. So hopefully we'll guide you in the right direction today. Um, Sure. So, Rachel, I know the subject is really um, close to your heart. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your journey with hypermobility? Sure. So, I have ehlers danlos Syndrome. So, that's a form of hypermobility where it affects my collagen. Um, so, it took an awful long time for me to get the diagnosis. I'm currently working as a professional dancer as well as a sports massage therapist. Um, but... Is one of those conditions that obviously I've had it since I was a child. No one understands. Often you meet doctors and especially as a kid, they, they just put it off to things like growing pains or just being active and young and clumsy. Um, and it's actually, it was because of my sister. So EDS is genetic and my sister had big issues resulting in knee surgery. Um, and I managed mm. to pick up that um, because trying to get anywhere it's completely misunderstood and quite often mistreated so I would go to the hospital with dislocations they would strap it up say to rest or to not wait there for a couple of weeks which you eventually learn that with hypermobility is almost the opposite of what you should be doing because we need to strengthen those joints in place and if you just rest them they get weaker and it happens more often and it's it's quite upsetting to hear that this is your story as well because sadly amongst our clients uh we hear that quite a lot and it is really really upsetting and concerning that there's somehow a theme um amongst uh, the practitioners not being able to do that not obviously all of the practitioners some are brilliant and some are very helpful and obviously these are the ones that normally diagnose and, and ability but um what is really upsetting is this common theme of uh, people, you know, having all sorts of different issues, the pains, uh, the digestive issues, the dislocations or sublocations, um, and they tend to be dismissed or eventually actually very often told that they just be in hypochondriacs and they should probably just go um, and deal with the condition, which can be often really, really comfortable for many people. So... What I would probably ask you, Rachel, what are some of the things to look out for if we suspect that hypermobility might be to blame? What are some of the symptoms and what might be the things that we want to check out in terms of having the diagnosis? So obviously the immediate thing is if you are having dislocations or sublocations. So if your joints are feeling really unstable, um, obviously to diagnose, one of the things that's quite often used is the Baton scale. So mm. in this, there's five tests that make up to nine points. Um, so we're looking at whether you can bring your little finger back over 90 degrees, um, whether your knees and elbows hyperextend, whether you can touch your toes. And the only one that I can't do is bringing your thumb back down to the flexor part of your forearm, which <laughs> you can't do anyway. Um, and I think this is another misconception that people think that if you're hypermobile, every you're hypermobile everywhere, right? And that isn't the case. Not at all. Um, personally, I have my shoulders and my wrists are very hypermobile, but my hips and my lumbar spine aren't. Which, as a dancer, is come on, you can give me a break. 
<laughs> and it's another interesting thing, um, which tends to be because obviously we as human beings love being good at stuff and love excel at stuff. So a lot of dancers, a lot, a lot of yoga practitioners and uh, people that just practice yoga tend to have some degree of hypermobility. And these are usually the people that are the superstars in the class, the ones that can go um, prettle themselves in and out. And you just look yeah. at them thinking, how did you just, how did that happen? Um, it's and it's really an overslip and just legs everywhere. Exactly. Exactly. So the interesting part about dancing, so both of our backgrounds uh, start in dancing. So it's it's really exciting to, to actually talk to you today. Um, what is very interesting from my experience with dancers is that a lot of them are hypermobile, but a lot of them have no symptoms. Um, so they experience no pain and naturally, you know, they're training most, most of the times all of their lives or they continue training throughout their adulthood. Um, and very often they live a healthy, happy life uh, without actually any uncomfortable symptoms. Uh, now, some of the studies put it down to the fact that obviously as long as you are strengthening and a lot of dancers obviously do a lot of strength work and even dancing itself strengthen muscles and help you control and improve your proprioception. Um, so a lot of people put it down to that particular factor. Um, is your experience with dancers similar or do you, do you find a lot of people struggling? No. A lot of um, the people that think they're just flexible dancers, a lot of them are hypermobile without the issues. So obviously take EDS, it affects the collagen. So it's systemic. So it affects a lot more things rather than mm. just appearing double jointed or flexible. Mm. Um, it can be a matter of if you have flexible muscles, uh, if you don't have that much sensitivity in your muscle reflexes when they're feeling overstretched or if you're just lucky with some of the shapes of your joints then you can mm. appear mobile without the same kind of symptoms so the digestive issues the hormonal like the anxiety issues or things like easy bruising um, mm. reflect something more systemic rather than just being mobile Mm. And I think the one thing that I would like to say, because there's a lot of misconception about people practicing yoga uh, with hypermobility, and there's two schools very often, some people that say it's perfectly fine to do it because that's what you used to, and some people that claim it's the worst thing that you can do. Um, now, where I have always um, found the middle ground in that is that there are parts to yoga that can be extremely beneficial for people with hypermobility. It just is important that it's done under the supervision of someone that is aware about how hypermobile people can, don't want to use the word cheat, but get into an incorrect positions um, and how to go about it. And actually a lot of strength-based uh, exercises from yoga could be a fantastic way to improve the proprioception, improve the joint stability. Um, and it's not that all uh, yoga classes are the same, all yoga instructors are the same, but what I would would suggest for anyone thinking of uh, continuing yoga or picking up yoga with hypermobility is to make sure that the teacher understands their condition so they're able to correct you they're able to bring you back to a more neutral ranges of motion and not worsen your symptoms or further um, stretch beyond the optimal ranges uh, of motion precisely I think the number one rule whenever you're starting something new or continuing a practice is to find a good teacher and mm. to have a conversation with them and make them aware this is what you're facing and would you be able to help me with X, Y and Z, whether that be to watch more closely or to give some alternatives. Because I agree, yoga for hypermobile people can be incredible. Obviously, it increases your body awareness. So a lot of people with hypermobility struggle with proprioception. So they're not mm. entirely sure of where their limbs and joints are in space or at what angle they're moving their joints. So in that aspect, it's amazing. And obviously it is no impact. So you don't have that risk of a sudden dislocation from an impact. Um, and yeah, it increases that strength. It makes you so much more aware. And it's the intrinsic muscles. So rather than just focusing on the larger muscle groups, which often other workouts that strength and gym workouts do, you're looking mm. at those little have control of your joints and support your joints. So I think yoga is a fantastic thing. Yoga and Pilates, both of them, 
they're amazing for regular conditioning. Um, Absolutely. My regular scheme as well. So. Absolutely. And I think uh, it's worth mentioning to some people that might be now listening to us and thinking to themselves, oh, my God, I must be hypermobile because I've been dislocating myself playing sports. And this. it's not that straightforward, which is partially the reason why it's very often misdiagnosed for years. Um, you might have an extended ranges of motion and you might be perfectly fine. That does not mean you have hypermobility or you might be hypermobile just in certain joints. Now, another thing is that you might be getting injured just based of your poor proprioception. And that just means you need to improve that aspect of your training. And that's, I think, is really important to find the right practitioner who can properly diagnose you, assess your movement, and make sense of what's happening in your body. Um, the one thing that is really interesting is the is that well quite a large amount of bad luck that people have when it comes to finding those practitioners and very often um if you have a string of uh, unsuccessful stories with the trainers especially uh, the story tends to be the same it's like i went to the gym asked for a trainer you know i wanted to strengthen my muscles and then i was picking that large weights or just even light weights but doing a lot of jerky movements and quite dynamic movements and we know that Although this doesn't mean that you can't do them, they definitely should not be the starting point for people with hypermobility. So there are certain steps that we need to follow and there's certain things that we have to make sure that are right uh, before we start picking up any forms of a way. So that's where things go wrong and when we do too much too soon, um, that's when we end up in our offices. <laughs> exactly. Sorry, so from your experience, what are the exercises that worked best for you? So I found, as we were saying before, starting with yoga and Pilates. Um, I think I started ballet when I was two years old. Um, so obviously I was developing that from a very young age. Um, but it is that form of gentle exercise where you are focusing on positions and more of eccentric and isometric um, actions rather than just picking up weights and lifting heavy. Uh, mm. Quite often. Then we do have to be careful of repetitive injuries, repetitive strain injuries. Um, we can be more susceptible to those. So it's not about doing lots of reps. It's learning to do exercises that control, that take control through a whole range of motion. Um, it's all well and good doing standard movement patterns, just like pressing and things. But then if your arm is over here, you're then in a weakened position because you haven't trained your body to have the strength in that place. So, uh, yeah, Pilates is all about finding that core as well and fight yeah. finding that strength to connect all of your limbs. Yeah. And I think this is this is where um, it gets tricky for people with hypermobility. And this is where a lot of people looking after them that don't understand the condition want them to progress sooner than they necessarily are able to where actually one of the greatest success stories that I've had with training people with hypermobility is to allow them to find the unique patterns for their own body to help them connect with the right muscle group so you know let's talk about the infamous glutes right such a big thing to to have that connection between your mind and your body on how to actually engage the glute and once you do once you find that unique pattern for those people there are changes and there's a great understanding and the progression happens on its own. So we have to really be very mindful about the fact that, yes, they, they actually, people who have a mobility are amazing at exercises because they can get into all sorts of different positions that majority of people can't. I mean, you know, there are some of the best squatters I've ever seen in my entire life. However, yeah. then you place the weight or any kind of a thing on top of the shoulders and the problem starts because it's just not enough of that awareness to support and strength to support that weight. So it's about bringing that connection between what your brain knows what you're doing and what your muscles are doing before you start all those kind of, you know, really eccentric movements, um, which I guess, Rachel, in that case, what are some of the no-nos for people with hypermobility? What would you say stay away from? It is very personal to each individual. Mm. Um, I personally find swimming is amazing because it takes strength through that whole range. But I also mm. know other people with hypermobility that can't swim because they do a few strokes and suddenly their shoulders are starting to come out of place. Um, so it, 
rather than a no-no, I think my biggest thing is take the time and be patient with yourself and figure out what works individually for you. Mm. Um, it's going to be different for everyone. I know that a lot of people with hypermobility are very afraid of contact sports. Um, mm. Like as a child, I used to love playing football and hockey and I started getting into rugby and then the injury started happening and I was like, this probably isn't the best thing for me, especially mm. if I'm watching dancing. Um, but then I know other people that are hypermobile that play football all the time and that is how they condition their body because it's what it's got used to and they've yeah. got the strength in the movements that you're always doing. Um, but yeah, I think it's just about finding the type of movement that works for you and taking the time with it. So whether that be in a gym, like if we, for example, if you take a squat, obviously as hypermobile, we kind of, we find it quite easy to get right down into a deep squat, getting your bum to the ground. <laughs> a lot of guys in the gym. Um, but just because we can get there doesn't mean we should be because then do we have the strength behind it? So mm. rather than just getting your bum to the floor, you need to be thinking, okay, let me slow this down. Let me get that eccentric strength. So we're getting the strengthening through the lengthening or mm. even you stop in a few different places on the way down and get the isometric holds. Mm. Um, so it's taking exercises that people do without thinking a lot of the time and just slowing it back, stripping it back and finding out how we can actually get some benefit from them. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think don't get discouraged as well. If there's something that doesn't work for you, I mean, there's something that does not work for everyone, <laughs> whether you have hypermobility or not. So I think it's uh, it's very important to, again, not be discouraged by the fact that maybe you've tried, you know, getting help from other people, tried certain sports that didn't work for you. There's definitely something for you. And I think the message that needs to be taken from this conversation is that movement is crucial to help you actually improve your quality of your life day to day um so it can it can improve your proprioception can improve your balance it can improve your strength and as a result of that the stability and the and improve the strength of the stabilizing muscles of the joints so it's so important to include that it is just about finding the right routine and find the right person that can help you through it um and actually, one one very interesting fact, because I think a lot of people, um, and hence why I also really am a big advocate for the right type of yoga for hypermobility, um, people with hypermobility get stiffness. Um, yeah. And they get a lot of stiffness in quite, yeah. um, quite a few places. And I know that people are completely... <laughs> confused as to how a person with hypermobility can ever get stiff but they do and actually one of the best ways around it is to teach your muscles and teach that biomechanical movements that are correctly done so then you're using the right muscles you have a more of an awareness of how you twist turn and pick stuff up so that stiffness does not develop or does not develop to the same degree that it can otherwise um, I don't know if that's something that you had an experience with, but it's very interesting. Um, and I think everyone should be very much so aware that high mobility does not give you a free ticket of mm -hmm. fitness. I think the biggest thing is as well, high mobility doesn't mean you're excessively flexible um, mm. because it's more related to being within the joint itself. Your muscles can still get tight. Mine definitely still get tight. Um, and often I hear people with hypermobility thinking, oh, well, I shouldn't be stretching then. <laughs> and that's not at all. You should still be stretching. You still need your muscles to be stretching, especially before or after you're working out, especially if it's intense. The thing is, we don't need that to be the primary aim so much. Um, and as it is, you can be hypermobile in one thing and feel like you don't have the mobility in another joint. Yeah. Um, and we need, so if we take our spine, for example, we need flexibility, mobility in the top of our spine in the thoracic region, but we need the stability in the lumbar region. So if you've got a really mobile lower back and a really stiff upper back, that in itself can have issues. So then we mm -hmm. need to work on increasing that mobility in the upper back whilst finding the stability in the lower. Um, 
So very common with golfers. <laughs> I had a really bad example of a person who was quite heavily hypermobile and decided to pick up golf with that exact problem of no stability in the lower back and absolute stiffness around the upper back. And that, as you can only imagine with the swing of a golfer, it is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> the strain that would be put through the lower back then. And then obviously it has a knock-on effect for your hips. So it exactly. just goes on from there. And then another thing I think, um, which very often, and that's why I think I'm always a, such a big advocate for people seeking help from the professional with hypermobility. Just because you experience pain in one region, does not mean that that region is actually to blame. So if you have a knee pain, it might be your gait, it might be your calf, it might be your hip, it might be your lower back position. There might be so many things that are responsible for that. And actually having someone to assess that, put that into a proper plan for you and then help you deal with that means that you will be able to get that sorted and move on. And you're not going around from one practitioner to another and having million scans done on your knees with no particular problems coming out of it. Yeah, exactly. I see it all the time, especially recently uh, with lower back pain and people can't, like a lot of people think, oh, my lower back hurts. That has to be the issue. And often it's not, especially now with people sitting in the house a lot more with lockdown and everything. It's actually coming from the hips and the hip flexors and into the top of the legs, into the quads. And you're there and you're like, OK, your back hurts, but I want to massage the front of your leg. And people are like, what? <laughs> but you, do it and you do it and they're like, oh, actually, yeah, because it's obviously it then affects the angle of your pelvis and it affects how you're cool. standing, how you're sitting. and because your lumbar spine should be more stable, it's one of the first things that then feels stiff and sore. Absolutely, and it's. I think it's really important because there's there's been a, a quite a huge influx of people with hypermobility that have reached out to us during the lockdown. Um, so I think it's important to know that there is a lot that you can do being stuck at home. And I think looking at your setup and the desk setup that you are sitting on for hours at end is really, really important. So the one, I think it's important for everyone. So anyone who listens to us, whether you're hypermobile or not, having a proper desk setup is key. So if you don't have that, please make sure you reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to help you with that. Um, yeah. If you are hypermobile, especially uh, important because you are more prone to having those aches and pain and stiffness developing as a result of a bad posture. And if we're now sitting nine hours a day in that one bad position, um, it will always have an effect on how we feel and how the whole of our body performs and feels afterwards. Um, so there's so many things that can be done, but we need to make sure that the cause, the root cause of the problem is being addressed uh, so you can live a healthy, happy life like anyone else. Yeah. The other thing is make sure you are staying active. Um, it's so easy when we're spending all day, every day inside of our houses to let that go. But if you do that, the pain is likely to get worse, especially if you've got a bad work set up too. We need to keep moving, keep things mobile, and that will help to alleviate that stiffness and the pain. And Because like you said, even people that aren't hypermobile get stiffness from sitting all day. Yeah, if we then have that are easily aggravated. So it's a good time to start thinking about those gentle mobilizations in a good way of getting into activity. Obviously, we have people at the clinic that can help with advising suitable activity. Um, but yeah, it's Absolutely. you have to keep moving. Absolutely. And join one of our online classes. <laughs> we do actually have Pilates classes. We, we do do training tailored at people with hypermobility and together with our fantastic practitioners like Rachel, um, who is having a great extent of experience of working through obviously your own experience, but also working with people with hypermobility. Um, together, we can get you better and we can actually make your day really good <laughs> you make you feel really good <laughs> Rachel thank you so much for joining me that's been really good and I hope anyone who's listening to us and who's been um has been wondering uh if 
you know, hypermobility might be to blame. Am I hypermobile? Or where do I get those pains and aches from? Have a little bit of a guidance. Our first thing is to always, always, always seek some professional advice and hopefully the diagnosis that can actually make sense of what's happening in your body. And then seek a professional help from one of the musculoskeletal practitioners to help you both say, relaxed in a place that they're too tense and strong and mobile in a places that need that mobility and strength. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been great to have the chat. And I hope we've helped some people out there. Hopefully. If you have any questions, guys, please leave them in a comment section below. We'll get back to you. Have a good night. Thanks.